There is so far little evidence to suggest that in preparation for the trials of 1936 to 1938, Stalin acted alone, by his own intention or the purpose of a sinister scheme to destroy his opponents. This section will attempt to prove that although Stalin remained a major factor in the events of that occurred, he fell victim to party opportunists who sought to exploit his paranoia and murderous nature. To prove their loyalty, by proving treachery of others. In August 1936, the first of three trials began, the main defendants being Grigory Zinoviev and Lev Karmenev, who had taken control of Russia with Stalin after the death of Lenin. After they opposed Stalin in favour of Trotsky in 1929, they were out ousted from the Communist Party and subsequently imprisoned and trialled for the death of Sergei Kirov in 1934. Although he was in the clear, by the spring of 1936, Stalin became paranoid about existing opposition being left to thrive. As such, he ordered the NKVD to organise investigations. Those convicted were to be shot. The idea, however, of a show trial was not yet plotted. Enter Nikolai Yezhov. His involvement, along with that of Vorozhilov, Kaganovich and Virginsky, would be crucial in all three acts of the play. The idea of the trial, the confessions of Karmenev and Zinoviev, and the testimonies which would serve to convict the rest of the Politburo. Back to the spring of 1936. The arrests of former Trotskites spread further and those already in camps were resentenced. It was at that time Yezhov first suggested the creation of a political show trial to Stalin. Keen to show off his supervisory skills, he even wrote a book about the Zinovievites, which Stalin personally edited. Although no documented evidence has survived to implement Yezhov personally and nothing can be inferred from the trial records directly, there is sufficient proof of an internal party dispute at the time which indicated Yezhov as the chief defender of the idea. Yagoda, Commissioner General of the State Security, in charge of Yezhov, was sceptical about this nonsense and constantly undermined him. This process exhausted Yezhov, and in a telegram to Stalin, Kaganovich suggested Yezhov be spent on a special retreat for two months with a 3,000 rubles bursary. It was approved. Late in May, uh, the key to success of the trial were the confessions of Karmenev and Zinoviev. In July, after extensive interrogations led by Yezhov's NKVD supporters, Zinoviev asked to be able to speak to Karmenev. They were then demanded to speak to the Politburo. If the party would guarantee their lives, they would confess. What followed was a meeting, which historians have used for decades to put Stalin chiefly accountable for the trial of 1936. Karmenev and Zinoviev met a Politburo consisting of Voroshilov, Yezhov and Stalin. Stalin agreed to meet their demands, only to break his promise right after the trial. Nevertheless, ultimately this was not Stalin's doing. He may have created the deceit, but it was up to Yezhov and, and Vorozhilov to make sure it was credible. Yezhov's influence can be spotted in two respects, confirmed by the trial records. First, when Karmenev came to testify, he spoke with dignity and poise and fully cooperated with state prosecution. On the 20th of August, Karmenev retorted that It was no use counting on any kind of serious internal difficulty to secure the overthrow of the leadership, which was guided the country through extreme difficult stages through industrialization and collectivization. At this point, it was clear that the defendants-in-chief were unaware of Stalin's deceit. 
Previous experience had shown that Kamenev and Zinoviev did not respond well to torture or family threats. Thus considering only Yezhov and Dzerzhinsky had access to them, it's clear that Yezhov had managed to construct a false premise of trust. The second moment came when Kamenev helped the state prosecutor in preparing evidence for a new trial and a second set of defendants. Kamenev stated, Knowing that we might be discovered, we designated a small group to continue our terrorist activities. It seemed to us that on the side of the Trotskites, this role could be successfully performed by Serebryakov and Radek. Kamenev personally maintained relations with Tomsky and Bukharin. They sympathized with us. When I asked Tomsky about Rykov's frame of mind, he replied, Rykov thinks the same as I do. Zinoviev confirmed his testimony. What possible gain could Zinoviev and Kamenev have had to implicate their former comrades, an occurrence which did not appear in the preliminary trial scenario? Assuming as before they were not tortured, they most probably added these statements expecting a return gain. Who then had access and the most gain from Tomsky, Bukharin and Rykov's deposition? The only possible candidates were Vorozhelov and Yezhov who had numerous and personal political disputes with the three in the past, especially after Bukharin had supported Stalin against Trotsky. Bukharin's fall would be their triumph. As for Stalin, there is no question he was aware of the game change, but curious to go any further. In August 1936, he was not yet fully committed to the idea. As quickly as he was convinced, only months later would he change his mind under pressure from the Politburo. Summing up the evidence, it is clear Yezhov, with the help of Vorozhelov, was the chief driving force of the 1936 trial and instigator for the next. He was in favour with Stalin as a result of his idea to organise a political show trial. He had carefully planned and manipulated the evidence so as to oust his enemies and prove his loyalty and obedience. By the end of the trial, Yezhov had become more powerful than his NKVD senior, Yagoda, he had made strong political alliances with Stalin's closest advisers, namely Voroshilov and Kaganovich. The show trial was his right to power, and he wasn't about to let go.